Last week we, we talked about this amazing character, Abraham. Of all the men that ever lived, he, he had a title that no man ever had. Moses, David, Joshua, all the great heroes in the Old Testament. Nobody ever had one thing that Abraham had. What was it? Fun? Friend of God. Did you ever think God needed a friend? We think he's kind of remote, somewhere in eternity, doesn't need friends. But he called Abraham his friend. In fact, I don't need a hymn, it's in our book. Since it's a Baptist book, but it's in Methodist books. The God of Abraham prays who reigns enthroned above. Ancient of everlasting grace and God of love. Jehovah great I am, by earth and heaven confessed. We bow and bless the sacred name, forever blessed. And Abraham was the friend of God. Didn't, he, didn't God say, shall I hide from Abraham the things that I do? And God has promised to share secrets with those who trust him. The secret of the Lord is with who? TV preachers. No, bishops. Sorry, popes. No, hopeless. But who do you share his secrets with? Those that fear him. You see, there's a holy fear as well as a natural timidity, nervous fear. Well, we've mentioned about these heroes. I've told you before, let me repeat quickly. If I'd been writing Hebrews 11, I wouldn't have put this gang in here, I'll tell you that. Why should he put Abraham in? He lied. He deliberately went out of the path that God chose for him. I wouldn't have put Moses in this chapter. He committed murder. I wouldn't have put Noah in the chapter. He got drunk. There's a whole bunch of rascals in this chapter. It's a rogues gallery, actually. So I wonder you're not in it. But anyhow, <laughs> not all the failures are there yet. On the other hand, there are some people I would have put in. I would have put Joshua there. He isn't there. He's there by influence, by faith. The walls of Jericho fell down. But goodness, what's it going to be in a hero if nobody knows? You've got to get some credit somewhere. But you see, it's at the end of the line. The bottom line is the judgment seat of Christ for everybody. Whether we uh, like it or not. That's the bottom line the judgment seat of Christ. <clears throat> well, I better get on with the story, eh? Let's look in this... Wait a minute, which chapter? I marked it as usual, lost it. Chapter 22. <coughs> now let's say this again, remember. <coughs> As we said so very often, faith, faith that is going to be trusted is going to be tested. As I tell you rather humorously, my, my muscles are hard to find. <laughs> I never exercise them. Somebody asked saw Paul one day when he was five years of age. When you get old, what are you going to work at? He said, I'm going to be like my daddy. I won't work. I'll just be a preacher. <laughs> He's learned better since. But if you don't develop it, you know, usually thing you don't develop it. And you won't develop faith sitting here or looking at a, a blackboard. This man is tested right down the line. In the first place, God says to him, get thee up out of thy country and out of thy kindred. He, he tested on the, on the, uh, in his relationships. Well, then when he gets up, it says in the 51st chapter of Isaiah, I called Abraham alone. Did he go alone? So he set off in disobedience. He took Tira with him. In Hebrew, that word Tira means delay. Who was Tira? He was the old man. And you'll never get anywhere until you get rid of the old man. Then when you get rid of the old man, you have a problem with the young man. Somebody asked me today, do you believe in two natures? Yes, not three. The man that says he believes in two natures believes in three. 
He believes in a spiritual nature, a sinful nature, and a human nature. I don't believe in that. I believe in a spiritual nature and a human nature. You see, the trouble with modern Christianity is it isn't modern Christianity. I asked a big shot guy who came to see me today. He's a millionaire, I think, but anyhow. He was disgusted. That's a pleasure. When he got up at my office, disgusted, I'm delighted. <coughs> I said to him, is, is the sixth chapter of Acts the norm for a deacon? Who's in the sixth chapter of Acts? Stephen. What did he do? Signs, wonders, miracles. Any, any, any deacons in the First Baptist Church in town or famous green acres like that? Or anybody at Church of God or anywhere? Now, don't mention names. Just say I said it. Where are there any biblical deacons? He's a deacon. isn't a man being preacher. And he does signs and wonders and miracles. Now, when were they put him to death? They put us to death if he were apostolic. Pentecost in the Bible again is married to what? Pain, pain, prison, punishment, poverty. What's it married to today? Prosperity, personality, superstars. We're a million billion miles away from New Testament Christianity. And I told this big shot today, I said, I'm looking for a church where you can open the door Sunday morning and say to that world outside which is scarred by what happened at PTL and those other places, it's scarred. And it's scared by the coming atom bomb and what have you got. Open the doors and say to the world outside, this is that which is spoken of. What is it? It may be your condition of being a member of your church. You have to speak in tongues to do something else. And that's all right. But where is the church that can open the door and say, this is that. Come and see Pentecost repeated. I believe Pentecost is the norm that God never intended the church should backslide. He intended every deacon to be like Stephen. Then you've got an evangelist by the name of Philip in the 8th chapter. What did he do? Signs and wonders and miracles, cast out demons, and everybody in the synagogue clapped their hands. They were happy. It didn't say that. What did it say? It says the whole city rejoiced. I got my friend today, anyhow, at least. He's going to buy one copy of uh, Azusa Street. Do you have some with you tonight, Jane? You won. You'll have to loan it. Okay. <laughs> Get that book of Zuzu Street, then get the other one. Seven pioneer Pentecostal preachers. If those don't put you on your face, you must be dead. I mean, that happened in our day in England in 1926 and 7. Men who were not ordained, men with almost no Bible knowledge, went into cities and rented buildings, holding 2,000, packed them within a week, and turned thousands, or literally thousands away. And in two weeks, 924 people went through the inquiry room. There isn't a man on TV has an inquiry room yet. Go from Billy Graham to Earl Roberts to Jimmy Swaggart. Everybody come up and say a word. This stupid business, close your eyes and bow your heads. Supposing a girl said that to her boyfriend, just going to the wedding, she said, well, darling, I've lived for this day, but uh, just tell a preacher that when I walk down the aisle to marry you, ask everybody to close their eyes and bow their heads. Wouldn't that be wonderful? He'd say, get out of here. If it any sense, anyhow. What is embarrassing about going to the front to get a relationship with God? People ought to be glad to act on their hands and knees. Crawl down the aisle to be reconciled to God. Crawl down the aisle to get rid of condemnation and bondage and sin. But no, no, we make it so easy. We're just about taking the cross out of Christian living. And yet Jesus says you cannot be a Christian without bearing a cross. You take up your cross and follow him. Well, there's the introduction. Shall we go on? Genesis 22. He came to pass after these things. After what? Well, again, the first thing, Abraham was tested with his family, tested with his nation. Then he goes on a trip with the old man. He has trouble with the old man. The old man dies. Then he has trouble with the young man. He's rescued Lot from death. I think one of the most common sins, pardon me, sins in the world today is ingratitude. Even amongst us, we don't have gratitude. Why, most of us would have been in jail or in hell tonight, but for the grace of God. So what's, what's this man doing? The old man, uh, he got rid of the old man. He didn't want to go on. He didn't want to get, go down into the promised land. And so now you have the young man. And Lot, Abraham says, Lot, if you take that side of the valley, I'll take this. 
If Lot had had half an ounce of being a gentleman, he'd have said, Uncle, you rescued me when, when the a contract was out for my life. You, you take the... No, he says, he chose the well-watered plains of Jordan. And he pitched his tent. The very slant of his tent post showed his interest. He pitched his tent towards Sodom. The next chapter is in Sodom. The next chapter is out of Sodom. A very expensive thing to disobey God. Lot chose Sodom, why? Because he says it was like unto Egypt. Why did he go to Egypt? Because his bungling old uncle took him there. Again, I say, if you want your child to go to hell, buy him a, buy him a, uh, a TV all for himself in his back room and, and destroy him. When this young man went to, to, uh, to Egypt and he saw the ways of Egypt, sensual, earthly, sensual, and devilish, he wanted to go that way, so he went and he became the mayor of the city because it said he sat in the gate. That's where the judges sat. That's where the authority was. That's why the Bible says the gates of hell. It doesn't mean gates. It means the authorities who sit there will not prevail against the Lord. But this young man goes and he gets fascinated with the city and he becomes the mayor of the city. Then he has trouble. After the young man he has trouble again. Trouble tested on the level of his parents, tested on the level of his, uh, his nation, uh, tested in his relationship with a young man, tested as to whether he treasured the things of this earth more than spiritual things. And yet he goes on. Now this is the sixth and final testing in his life. What does God say to him? Look at this quickly with me. He said, he said, take now thine only son, Isaac. Go back a minute, please, to chapter 17 and verse 19. <coughs> I'm sorry, verse 18. And Abraham said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. What had happened in between? You remember the test that came? He had fought off every trial that he'd had, except when his wife came and said, I can never bear children, I'm 90 years of age. Take your servant, it's a custom. And immediately the baby is born, put that baby on my lap, and according to law, it's my baby. And a man who had obeyed God and disobeyed God disobeys again. What happened? Ishmael was born. And here he is crying to God. What does he say? Verse 18 of chapter 17. Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Why? Because he's a child of the flesh. So what does God say in this chapter we're reading just now? Chapter 22. It came to pass after these things, verse 1, God did test, or test Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, Abraham. He said, Now take now thine only son. He, but he had a son. And according to the law of the Old Testament, the law of the firstborn, the firstborn got a double portion of everything. But God completely ignores Ishmael. He was born of the flesh, and he stood against the child of the spirit. God will never honor flesh. When the oil was put on the head again of the priest, in, a, in the third, uh, Psalm 133, it says the oil was on his head, it ran down his beard, onto his garments, and onto the floor. It never touched his flesh. Never. There's no anointing of flesh. You say that man's talented. If he got saved, listen, that man's talents may be his biggest hindrance to God. He's self-sufficient, he's trained, he's confident. He isn't afraid of crowds, he's been a politician. He can argue, he can reason, he has a good memory. And maybe those things are in his way. God says, no, I'm not taking Israel. Oh, he'd have been glad to get rid of Israel at this state. Take thou thy son, and only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. See, there it is. And get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer for him on a burnt offering upon one of the mountains I will tell thee of. Let's, let's say, for instance, here is... Uh, is for argument, here's, here's a mountain. God says you to go up there. He's down here. And it tells you that he takes a three-day journey there. 
Verse 3, Abraham rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and took his young men with him. And Isaac his son and played the wood for a burnt offering and rose up and went into the place which Abraham, God had told him of. On the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. I don't know if you use a little graphic thing like this we do, do in England. They say there's, there's many a slip between the cup and the lip. You, you use, that, use that phrase? You don't. Well, the, the educated people at the front do, and the people at the back don't. They went to, some went to night school so they can think at night, the others can only think in the day, you see. So. There's many a slip between the cup and the lip. The famous C.T. Stubb changed that. He said there's many a slip between the call and the ship. That wonderful old man I fellowship with him many times, the founder of the Pirelli Bible Institute, I believe the, one of the greatest Bible schools in the whole world. You can send your children there at 10 years of age, they can still tell they, stay there till university age. It's one of the finest schools, it's disciplined, Mark you. But he told me once, he said, when we have our great conferences, out of every hundred people that come to the front to go to the mission field, only ten of them ever go through. And only one out of the ten goes to the mission field, but the other nine stay at home. Out of a hundred. Oh, yes, yes. Well, there we go. There used to be a song called Just a Pair of Sparkling Eyes and a Pair of Ruby Lips. And it doesn't take the devil. Some girlfriend can knock you out for the rest of your life. Or some sparkling young fellow. This is a chance of a lifetime. Get married. I preached at a certain university a few years ago. It was packed. About 900 students there. I got late, and, and I came in and sat at the front, bowed my head, and somebody knocked my knee. I looked, and there was one of the most gorgeous young women I've ever seen. She said, you remember me? I said, no. Oh, she said, just over three years ago, you preached one night on Isaiah 6, well, 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 go. I said, I've preached that a few times around the world. She said, well, you said, look, leave it in the hands of God. Don't dare to move unless you're absolutely certain. And you said, you go home and put your name on the top of the paper and put down what's wrong with you. And then when you've run out of material, pray and ask God, what, what else is wrong? Well, the Lord showed me these things wrong, this thing wrong. One thing impatient. I was going to marry the most handsome man in America. And you said, you talked about a vision of a holy God, a vision of a lost world, and a vision of self. And you said that world is calling and, and God is calling you. But go home and talk to God. So she said, I went home. And the Lord said, no. No dating with that fellow. And she said, but Lord, he's the most handsome man in America. Any girl will want him. She said, well now, he's coming. And I look, here's this handsome young guy coming. And she said, three years afterwards, I went to a meeting, and he came to me and said, Hi, remember me? Mm, yeah, I remember you, all right. Why do you remember? Oh, wait a minute. Honey, I want to tell you something. The night that Raymond preached, I went home. I, told, I said, Lord, that's the girl I'm going to marry. He said, yes, that's right, three years from now. And he said, I've come to tell you I want to marry you. And he said, I went home and said, Lord, she's the most beautiful girl in America. Every guy we want and I'll never get Lord said, I'll keep her for you. So three years after they met, and the Lord had told each other the same thing. Three years from now, you can get married. So some of you bachelors, cheer up. Three years from now, you may make it. <laughs> some of you girls, take off your, your robes of uh, misery. <laughs> you see, there's an appointed time. I not only believe in the sovereignty of God over the world, I believe in the sovereignty of God in my own life. There's a timing in the affairs of men. It's not just as the poet says, there's a Shakespeare, but I won't quote him anyhow. But you see, there's a timing, okay. There's when you slip, he's down here and he has a three day journey up there. Well, let's say for a m moment, he sleeps at night and he wakes up and the moon's shining on the boy. And God has said, Take thine own miss, that's my darling child. My wife won't have any more babies, she's a hundred years of age. Didn't you think he went through misery? Don't you think he could have said why? 
that we think he could have offered a hundred excuses. But he keeps, he keeps going on, you see, as something happened to him. As I mentioned last week, Cain, Cain built a city. John saw the city. Abraham looked for the city. And it was a fact that he had a promise of God. I am with thee. He says, I will be with thee. I'll strengthen thee. I'll help thee. And because of that, he has confidence. When we were talking about Noah, you remember Noah building his ark for 120 years. Don't you think he went through a million heartbreaks, headaches, tummy aches, heartaches, every ache? 120 years, people scorned him, ridiculed him. Don't miss the beat there. He said it's going to rain. It had never rained in the history of the world. Dew fell every morning and watered the earth. And this crackpot preacher says there's going to be holes in the sky and holes in the ground and the water is going to go up and the water above is going to come down and he's going to go sailing in a boat. Isn't that wonderful? They've never even seen a boat. Now don't, don't think God's going to go before you and iron out all the difficulties. He's not. There's a testing of faith. And for 120 years, well, why did he hang on there? I'll tell you why. Number one said his family would be saved. Number two, God said he would destroy the earth. Number three, he said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. Well, why in God's name is the church so bankrupt today? Because Jesus says as it was in the days of Noah. There's a doomsday hanging over the world right now where time is running out. And we're doing nothing. I told you, if you know a church on fire for God, tell me. And I'll go. A church where when you go out, come in, you don't go out the same. The brooding of God is there. You've been in his holy presence. Lord, every day he goes. If you'd heard him whipping that saw, you'd have heard his groanings of his spirit louder than the saw. He's building a, 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 he's building a lifeboat for himself. He's building a casket for the rest of the world. Every day he goes to work. This is one day near of judgment. One day near of God's mercy running out. And God says to our generation, and I remind you again, of all these people in Hebrews 11, not one of them ever had a Bible. They subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, willing and received their dead, raised to life again. Of course, they lived in lovely homes, air-conditioned. The women all wore fur coats. Sure they did. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins. Those were their fur coats. Now the, the pastor's wives go to Neiman Marcus and buy one. They wonder about destitute, afflicted. And the world says, let's get rid of them. They're not any good. And God says, of whom the world is not worthy. Just a different angle. All people say, when was crazy. Well, who wants to be insane? If the world's insane, I'm glad to be... Uh, if the world is sane, I'm glad to be crazy. Who wants to be like those clowns? Hmm? So clever with their BA degrees, they just know how to get VD, and they know how to get AIDS, and they know how to do every devilish thing, but they can't break the power of sin in their lives. There's only one that's able to do it, and that's through the old rugged cross. So for three days, he takes me by every step. Verse 4 said, On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place of fire off. Abraham said to his young men, Abide ye here with the ass. And I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again. Isn't that faith? We'll come again. You stay here. You know, you can't do all your dealings before people. Some things are privately with God. There's no showmanship here. I and the lad will go yonder and we'll come again to you. Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took fire in his hand and a knife and they went both of them together. Well, isn't that something? Isaac spake to Abraham his father, said, My father, he said, Here am I, son. And he said, Behold the fire in the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb. Go quickly, don't look at it. The seventh chapter of the Acts of the Apostles says what? But God Almighty, the Holy God, appeared to Abraham where? In a hellhole called Mesopotamia. It was a super nightclub. It was a, an enlargement of, uh, what do you want to call it, Las Vegas and all those other dirty holes. 
They have all the sensuousness and they worship demons and they worship snakes. And yet in that rotten place, God appeared to Abraham. It doesn't say that. It says the glory of God appeared to him. Do you think he saw that into eternity? What's the glory of eternity? The lamb in the midst of a throne. You see, we're so short-sighted. We're so rationalistic. We're so thoughtful. We've so many fanciful, wonderful interpretations of the scripture. Friend, you, friend, you don't always need the scriptures as sedative. There are times when you need the scripture to bind up the broken heart. There are times when I need it to pierce me with its sharp twenty sword and God to work on me. We're only here a little time. Remember, friend, once somebody pronounces death over you, there's no U-turn. If you're on the broad road that leads to this church, you go to hell, there's no U-turn. Once you die, there's no turn in the road. Once you die on the narrow way, there's no turn in the road. It's straight on the narrow road to the judgment seat of Christ. It's straight on the broad way to the great white throne. That's going to be the most staggering thing that's ever happened. You're talking about the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's the Judge of Judges too. And his sentence is final. There's no course of appeal beyond it. Once the sentence is passed, boy, it's doomsday. You'll never persuade me in a hundred attempts. You can't persuade me that the Church of Jesus Christ tonight, I don't care how fundamental and apostolic it professes to be, you'll never get me to believe that the Church today believes in hell. This one thing needs to stick in your mind. It's in mine has been for months. Hell has no exits. A million roads in, not one road out. It says concerning heaven, they go in and out, day and night. It doesn't say that about hell. Once in hell, it's forever and ever and ever. It's doomsday. No repentance, no preachers, no mercy, no love. All the de human depravity, exaggerated as you like, and there it is. In that sense, hell to me is the drainage pool. You have a cesspool into your house. Hell is the cesspool of the ages. Even demons are going to be there. I believe at the moment hell is empty. I believe the first pe person into, the, into hell uh, will be the false prophet and the beast. But anyhow, any, it's going to be occupied finally. Okay. Verse 9. He came to the place which God had told him of. Notice he's taking directions from God. Look at verse 11 for a moment. The angel of the Lord called him out of heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Look at verse 15. The angel of the Lord called him to him out of heaven. Isn't that amazing? You don't find that again until the heavens are open and Jesus has been baptized. And a voice from heaven says, This is my beloved son. And God is giving the same thing to Abraham here. You're my son. I'm asking great things. Verse 9, he came to a place which God told him of, and Abraham built an altar. Look at it. He's building an altar. What do you do? He goes to his son, he says, Isaac, get over the end of that rock, that flat rock, and they build an altar. Wouldn't that be agony for the father? Don't you think the son is thinking, what in the world is all this about? But he says, Daddy, you've got a basket. You see, they used to carry a basket like you do, but it was a basket made of metal. And they carried fire in it. That was a custom. And he said, Daddy, you've got the basket there with the fire. You've got the dagger in your hand. Uh, where is the lamb? God will provide himself a lamb. But again, think of the boy. Supposing you went to your 18-year-old boy and said, Come on, we're going up hunting. And you said, let's build an altar. Then you said, lay down. Do you think he would at your command? Then he tied his feet up. And he died. Do you think he'd punch you on the nose or kick you out of the way? He's led as a lamb to the slaughter. He's typical of the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you think he felt like lying there on his back with the sun blazing down? His daddy has a big dagger over him. You know, Dore wrote that, gave us that first picture of the uh, praying hands. Dore, the German. He also has a fantastic picture of Abraham, a long bearded man, and the boy is laid out on a stone slab, and he has a dagger in his hand. What do you think the boy felt like? 